The Bible says, where there, the Spirit of the Lord is there, 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 there is liberty. There, there is freedom. So what a joy to be walking and fellowshipping with freedom and liberty of the Lord this morning. My name is Peter. I am born again. Christ is Lord and Savior for the sake of those who we are meeting for the very first time. I am glad to be here. I am a son in this house. And I want to thank all of you for having me and thank uh, the leadership of this house, the Deliverance Church, uh, led by our bishop, Dr. Jimmy Kemani, and our mom, Reverend Alice, wherever they are, and here in Shiloh, under the cover of Pastor Brian and Pastor Beatrice, Pastor Richard, and all protocols observed. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning again. Good morning. Um, the topic of today is help in weakness. Praise the Lord. Um, when you speak of help, help speaks of hope. Wanna see you? Help speaks of hope. And when you speak of hope, uh, it has a connotation, this is my own opinion, of some weakness. You are being helped because there is something you cannot achieve or you cannot effectively do. So you need an extra hand in it. Wanna see you? Uh, let us read the word of God from Zechariah chapter 4 and verses 6 to 7 and see what the Lord is doing today. This is the word of the Lord and it says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So he answered, let me repeat verse 6 please. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with the shouts of grace. Grace to eight. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word today and this morning. We Keep quiet and silent to listen and to hear from you. Minister to us, Holy Spirit. Speak to us. We are listening. We pray that any voice, any idea that distracts and interrupts, we rebuke it sharply in Jesus' name. We offer our minds and our hearts and spirit and our body, God, that we shall be present in physical form and even in our minds here as we hear from you, God. Thank you. May your word bring light, may your word bring life, may your word bring freedom. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And as we have read that not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. As I said, that when we speak of uh, help, there's a connotation of some weakness. And this is the weakness you are being told. Yes, I know you are strong. You have some might and some power to some extent. But that one will not help you here. It is by my spirit. That is what the Lord is saying to us this morning. That whatever you thought you will do by any of yourself, it is not going to happen. Unless you depend on the spirit of the Lord, that is when it is going to happen. So number one, I want to speak three things from that verse. Number one, that it will happen, but not by your own power and might. Somebody got me? It will not happen but not according to your own strength. Not by might, not by power, but by, by spirit. We cannot achieve anything in and of ourselves. That is what the Lord says. Number two, the spirit of the Lord is the genesis of every success and victory that we can ever dream or have of. If it is first birth in the spirit, it will manifest. It is not by might again, or by power, but by my spirit. And the Bible says that those who worship me shall do so in spirit and in truth. So the business here we are transacting this morning is spiritual business. We are coming to say that, Lord, we desperately need you. We desperately need your spirit this morning. And the third point is that the secret of threshing any mountain this morning and this year is a surrendered soul. A surrendered soul for us to win anything. We have to submit and depend fully, not partially, not halfway, not almost, but fully on the Spirit of God. As I speak this, I also speak to myself. Because if there's anything we can do, the Bible says that uh, you do not 
rejoice or you do not uh, delight in sacrifices, but a contrite and a broken spirit, you will not do what? It is a broken and a contrite spirit. That is the heart of surrender. Praise the Lord. We cannot do anything, or the Lord cannot do anything to us while we are withholding everything. We need to release ourselves. I know it is not easy, but just release yourself. Release yourself to the Spirit of the Lord. Let the Lord minister. Let the Lord teach you. Let the Lord guide you. We cannot continue depending on our experience. In our past experiences, we cannot continue depending on our, how we did it yesterday. We cannot depend on our knowledge. This is where that everything we have, we leave it there, and now we depend on the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Uh, I have said that when we speak of help, uh, it has a connotation of weakness. And I want to admit and submit to us that human beings uh, have been in need of help. Not because it is today, not from today, from the time immemorial. We have always been in need of help. Regardless of how we may think we are sufficient and adequate, the truth of the matter is, at the face or in the face of some mountain, we shall prove to be helpless. We shall prove to be needing this help. We need help. We all need help. We need help. And this help is universal. The help of God is to everybody, regardless. Even those who are not born again, even us who are born again, we need help. We need help. We need help to help us as believers in our walk in salvation. The Lord to help us. Even as we walk, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says, if you read the next verse, it is he who works in us both to will and to do. So this is not our own. Yes, we have our part, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. It is a partnership. We have to allow God to do in us both to will and to do. Because he is the one who works in us. Bonus, if you will. Uh, when God created man, he created man with a certain kind of dependence that we should only depend on God. The way we, we are wired, we are wired that only God can complete us. We are not complete without God. Uh, God is our source. And just like a tree uh, uh, connected, or just like a tree with its root that draws water to it and nutrients, that's the same case with God. Our roots should be in God, and our God should be our source. If you are disconnected, then there's no life, no business as usual. The atmosphere and the environment we operate in should be God, just like fish to water. If you remove fish from water, it will die. True or not true? It will die, because you have removed it from the environment. So I want to tell us and urge us that our environment this morning should be in God. If there's any business we are going to transact, let it be in God. God is our source. We should depend fully on him. In the book of John chapter 15 and verse 5, uh, the Bible says that I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears or bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. He who does what? Abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do it is as clear as that. You can do nothing without depending on God. We can do nothing this morning. Just allow ourselves to be used of God. And then another, the other point is that nobody is beyond help. Nobody is too weak to be helped. Nobody here feels too strong or should feel too strong to need help. We all qualify regardless of our status, regardless of anything. We all qualify and need help. And the kind of help I'm talking about here, only God can offer. As, as I've said, again, there is a kind or a certain kind of gap and void that only God can fill. Only God can fill that. Psalms 121, verse 1 to 6. I will read Psalms 121, verse 1 to 6. This is what the Bible says. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Uh, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. That is the word of the Lord. He knows his work. He shall not sleep. He does not slumber. He keeps you. So, where, when you look around and about, I pray that your help 
will come from the Lord. The psalmist was lifting his eyes and was saying, when I lift up my eyes to the mountains, where does my help come from? It can only come from the Lord that made the heavens and the earth. There's some sort of confidence, again, we get when we know that our helper is God. Our helper is God. It is not my fellow, with all due respect. It is not your fellow uh, weak and prone to fail human being because we always fail. We always failed. So we get confidence. We know that the help from God cannot fail. God has said, and he will surely bring it to pass. So that is the confidence we have. Even the Bible says in the book of James, uh, the confidence we have when we approach God is that we know if we ask anything, if we ask, again, we are asking our help from God. If we ask anything according to his will, he does what? He hears us and he grants our requests. He grants our requests. When you know that it's God handling your case, everything about your perspective changes because God cannot mess, God cannot fail. He will always, he will always prove himself. And he has said in that verse we have just read in the book of Psalms that he, will not, he does not sleep, actually he does not sleep, he does not slumber. We, em- we employ night guards and I have, again, all respect for them. But because we are human and because we have a sleep hormone called melatonin, sometimes we tend to fall asleep. Sometimes we fall asleep. That is human weakness. But our God does not sleep. Our God is not affected by that sleep hormone. Amen? Amen. So when you, ha- you, you present your case to him, you can be sure that God will be up to the task. Amen? Amen. Um, the help you need is God. So, I want to caution you. Uh, stop looking for your help from a human being. And do not get angry when your friend does not live up to expectations. I want to repeat. If your friend fails to help you, do not be angry at them. You just knocked the wrong door. Knock and it shall be opened. When I come to you, Ian, and I want some help, and that help, you don't have it, why should I get angry? So let us look unto God. Praise the Lord. I'm speaking this so softly because I have been affected. You look up to your friends. You depend on them, maybe for something, for some help. They fail. They fail. And you feel feel hurt. And you feel offended. But I want to ask us, do not. You just knock the wrong door. There's a place. I'm not saying we should not help one another. What I'm saying is that there is part of God and there is part of human being. One as fear in any kind of help we need. So it is very necessary for you to demystify where you need man and where you need God. We can see this in Luke 5 uh, from verse 17 to 20. There were some men who had a paralytic man. They carried him to where Jesus was in a house. And because there was a lot of crowd, they did what? They lowered him through the roof. So that Jesus could heal him. So, the paralytic needed men to carry him up to the point where Jesus was. And from there onward, it was Jesus' business to make him well. Imagine if he had depended on this man to heal him. He would have stayed and remained like that for the rest of his time. So, I'm just saying, be at peace and love your friend and your neighbor, even when they fail to meet your expectations, even when they do not help you, even if they were able to. You just knock the wrong door. And the Bible says, knock and it shall be open. You knock the door of prayer. It is the door of prayer. You ask and you shall be given. You ask from God. Who gives everybody without favoritism? So can we be redirected and direct our minds and our attention to God? Because if we depend on God, he shall never fail. He shall not mess. He will always prove himself to be true. Uh, I want to do something. Uh, I want to read Isaiah chapter 41, verses 14 to 15. And uh, I want to analyze that text for a moment. And I want to sound a disclaimer. If you, if you feel I will go uh, somehow t- deep into uh, literature, forgive me, but I will help you to understand uh, so that we can learn together. Bonus if you will. It's only for the purpose of understanding. It is not uh, for anything else. Bonus if you will. I'm not the most brilliant here, so I just want us to understand. Isaiah chapter uh, uh, 41, 14 to 15, the word of God says, Fear not, you warm Jacob, uh, you men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord. 
and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Verses 15. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. Uh, the context of that, those two verses, uh, or those two verses were written in a place, the other verses, by the way, from verse 1 all the way down there. If you read that, those verses, you will find that uh, it is talking of war, time of war. There are some people preparing for war, others helping one another, others being very helpless. It's a time of war. So the prophet Isaiah wrote this when Israel was at war with her neighbor nations or with other nations. So that is the context. So the kind of help, this is helping us to understand that God is promising help even in a time of war. Um, let me look at a few figures of speech here. And number one, uh, if we can read that again, uh, verse 14 says, Fear not. You find it in quotation, in opening and closing speech marks. Fear not, you warm Jacob, you men of Israel. This is exact word that was said. They are reporting word for word. This is what we call direct reporting or direct speech in first person. The Lord is not telling uh, someone to report. He is reporting directly through the mouth of prophet Isaiah. So, and the purpose of this, according to my thinking, is that it retained the meaning and made sure that things like tone, mood, attitude were not lost there. Because if you, you see, fear not, it is exactly and directly from God. Fear not. It is not like the Lord said, do not fear. The Lord is saying, fear not. Right now, fear not. So it is as direct as like that. And uh, again, I said, where there is help, there is uh, the element of hope. So the mood of that whole uh, passage is hopeful. There is hope there. There is hope there. Yes, you are in war. Yes, you are intimidated. Yes, there is all this. But fear not. I will do what? I will help you. The second figure of speech I want to do is symbolism. Uh, symbolism is use of symbols to represent another thing. And it is highly employed there. And a worm is used. The Lord is saying that, fear not you worm, Jacob. Worm is not the second name of Jacob, no. It is a figure of speech used to mean something. So Jacob, the other name of Jacob was Israel. Good, good student, not a worm. Warm is a symbol, is useless symbolically there. So, uh, it represents weakness again. It represents, in a way, helplessness. Because if you understand a warm, a warm. But they ask your neighbor, what do you call a warm in your mother tongue? Ask them. At least you will learn one vocabulary. In your mother tongue, what do you call a warm? Yes, whatever you call them. I hope they have told you. Yes. Um... Thank you. The mountains, they are another symbol, mountain. Mountains here, they are used to symbolize or to represent strength, might, and power. And the mountains in this case represent the other nations that warred against Israel. Warm represented Israel. It symbolized weakness and represented Jacob, Israel, and the men of Israel. Let me look at a metaphor. Uh, we all know what a metaphor is. A metaphor is a phrase or a uh, words used to represent something direct, directly. There are no uh, comparative words like like, as or such as. It is directly used. And here we see uh, the Bible saying, you warm, Jacob. He's not told you, are, you, are, you look like a warm or you are weak like a warm. You are a warm. No, it's not abusive. It is not abusive. This is the Lord speaking to us. Bonas figure. Yes, when the Lord calls you a warm wanjala, you are one. It is not me. Praise the Lord. It is not me, it is the Lord. So the Lord wants to drive the meaning home very emphatically by exactly and directly calling Jacob a warm. And you could be representing Jacob, me and you here. So we are warms to the glory of God. The good thing is we shall not remain to be warms forever. Amen? We shall be transformed into a new sledge, threshing sledge with the sharp teeth. Bonas so there is hope. Uh, there's something we call irony. Uh, irony, it, it is far-fetched. I want to, it's far-fetched. When you know the story of Jacob, uh, Jacob together with the mother, the mother of Jacob was called who? Amen. The mother too, Jacob was called, and the father was called, and the brother was called, 
Thank you so much. So Jacob, together with the mother, they perform a coup d'etat in quotes. They host and dethrone the firstborn of that house. Bonas uh, They dethrone him so that Jacob can get in that place, so that he can get the blessings that belong to. When you look at that, you can see some brains, right? You can see some kind of intelligence, humanly speaking. That this person was able to even. Where, where, by the way, <laughs> I am a last one where I come from. Uh, I don't know where that is possible nowadays. I don't know. So that must have called to a high level of IQ and intelligence. You see, you look at Jacob, they were able to trick their father and get the blessings that were meant for Esau. So when you look at that, you see some kind of brilliance or intelligence, some brains. But despite all that trickery skills and brains, the Lord is calling him what? A worm. You remember Jacob is the person still who wrestled with an angel and he got his blessings? So this is a person who is known to get what he wants. Go get her in the house, praise the Lord. I am aggressive and I go get her. I will <laughs> those CVs. I'm gonna see this. I'm so aggressive. <laughs> I'm so aggressive, self-driven, go getter, and team 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 player, all those things. <laughs> Such was Jacob. Such was Jacob. So aggressive that he said, I will not let you go until you do what? Until you bless me. But here, he's confronted with another mountain. He, he's just helpless. He's just a worm. He cannot do anything. It reaches a point when you cannot depend on your past experiences, as I said. It reaches a point when you need to admit that. Yes, you did it. But this time around, you need God. Yes, it might have happened by chance. But this time, unless God helps you, you cannot conquer. Because if it is the Lord who, who started it, believe you me, if he's not the one who sustains it, it will not be sustained. So whatever the Lord started, the Bible says that he who began what? The good work in us. He is able to do what? It is the one who began the good work. So if you started this with God, commit it unto him. You might have been brilliant in the past. You might have just maneuvered your way into that job or wherever you are. But this time, if it is not God, it is not going to happen. Praise the Lord. What is the significance of that, all those things we have said, worms, mountains, the symbolism? God compares Jacob uh, or the people of Israel to a mere weak worm, helpless worm, to show them the following. Number one, to show them their exceedingly great weakness and need for him. They are exceedingly great. You cannot, you cannot be weaker than a worm. As in, it can never go. I don't know. A worm. A worm. You just do like, you're just passing by. You don't even stop, you just continue. As in, it doesn't bother you, does not bother you too much. You just do like that. Praise the Lord. Amen. So you cannot, there's no any other thing to describe weakness than that. So uh, they have no power. The Lord used that to show they are exceedingly a great weakness and need for God. They have no power, no strength, no worth or glory. They are worthless and powerless. They are nothing. And for this reason, they are despised and humiliated by their neighbor, uh, the, the, the other nations. Uh, when Pastor Washo was preaching, she gave us a very good analogy of David and Goliath. And when David stood in that battlefield, there are some words he said, uh, that you have defied the armies of the living God. That is how they were being tortured and tormented and being defied. So this, this is the same thing here. That they were being humiliated because they were so weak, they had no glory, they... they, they, they in and of themselves, they were nothing. Actually, there were very few. If you can ha give us Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, the Bible describes that there were very few. There were very few. And we know that when it comes to war and, and battles, uh, there's strength in numbers. How, 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 many, how, how many military men are you able to, to command? Or like, how, how strong are you in terms of military capability? There is strength in numbers. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy 7, 7, that the Lord did not set his love on you, that is Jacob, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. You were the least of the peoples. You were the least of the peoples. The Lord did not choose you, whoever you are this morning, because you had a lot of strength, because you were too strong or too qualified. There is, there is a sense that God, or a design that God chooses the weak and the lowly. 
there's a kind of, it's by design that God chooses those. If we read 1 Corinthians 1, 28, we see again Paul reporting to the Corinthians and saying that God chose, and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, Sorry, I might have. Let me read what I have. And, and God chose what is lowly and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing, things that are. And God has chosen, yeah, the weak things of the world to put to shame, the things which are mighty. So it is by design that God chooses the weak and the lowly. To do what? To do what? Yes, Goliath was ashamed to death. Yes. He never defied the armies of the living God any longer. That is exactly what it means. A very good practical example is that. To put to shame. Because the Lord just wants to show you that however he created you, with your tall height, with your short height, with your whatever, however, God has a purpose and a design. It is not by your physicality. It is not by your masculinity or whatever it is. It is by the Spirit of God again. He chose you the way you are so that he can use you and put on display his glory on you. You who is lowly and you who is despised to his glory. One as if you were. Uh, number two, why the Lord uh, is calling or likening Jacob to a worm is that he wanted to show that that he alone can help them. God himself will help them. He alone can help them. He promises protection and deliverance. Actually, God commits himself to helping them until they make their enemies as chaff. Verse 13 says, For I, the Lord of Isaiah 41, for I, the Lord, your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, fear not, I will help you. For I, the Lord, your God, will hold your right hand and saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. I, the Lord, I will help you. This is committing, someone committing to come through for us. I will help you. I will not send any other person, but I will help you. Of course, that is relative. Maybe by the Lord saying, I will help you. He can help you in many ways, in many ways, in many ways. But here, the, the very first impression we get is that himself will help us. Bonus here. Himself, he himself, not any other person, not anything else. I will help you. So... He alone can help us. And sometimes God, God has a way of letting us see our weaknesses, of exposing our nakedness to him. The word of God says in Hebrews that the word of God is sharper to penetrating down to separation of joints and marrows and of soul and spirit so that everything is laid bare and unto him whom we should be accountable to. Everything is laid bare. So, um, if God exposes you, say, here I am, master, clothe me and help me. You cannot run away from God. And, and that is the prayer of each and one, every one of us should pray this morning. God, may you expose me to yourself. May you help me know where I need to improve. May you help me know where I have trusted in my skills too much, way too much. May you help me come to my senses and, 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 and know because some of these things, unless the Lord exposes them to us, we could be thinking we are in the right way, but we are not. Again, when you dwell in the presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit will always speak to you. So may the Lord help us. May the Lord help us. Uh, I want to check on some characteristics of fear. Fear not. Fear not. A fear, by definition from the dictionary, is an unpleasant emotion caused by anticipation of threat or danger. Anticipation. Anticipation of threat or, uh, or danger. Um, adrenaline has a play in it, uh, but it is not the source of the fear we are talking about. And the fear we are talking about here, if I may define it again, is that it's a weapon the enemy uses to terrorize God's children so that they do not become effective or productive in their salvation and ministry. It is a weapon of the enemy. So really adrenaline has nothing to do with it. It just comes to amplify the same. So do not blame your hormones again. What I'm saying is, fear is a weapon of the enemy. You know, you know sometimes we, we blame our, our physiology so much and our anatomy so much, we forget that it is the, Lord, the same Lord who created it. One has fear. So do not say, I am like this, you know, mood swings, you know, no. Committed to the Lord. One has fear. The Lord is your maker. He created you. He, he, by the way, the Lord is not beyond hormones. Anyway, 
I'm not in biology class, but I'm just trying to say, you don't have any excuse whatsoever for you not to surrender to the Lord. Whatever thing it is that is not aligned to the will and purposes of the Lord. He created, he deposited that in you. And in fact, if anything, uh, everything the Lord packaged us, there's nothing that we should. God created and said, it is good. You are hormones. You are whatever. It is good. So, what makes it bad is when you go overboard. Like the Bible says, sorry, that do not let the sun set in your, and in your anger do not. So when you extrapolate that and start condemning someone because you're angry, uh, having some resentment and bitterness, that is where you have gone beyond. But if, you, if that hunger helps you to realize that I have anger issues, you repent, that is okay, according to me. Bon as you Yes. <laughs> uh, number two thing about fear, uh, last Sunday, our bishop was here and he gave us a very beautiful statistic that fear uh, has been, fear not actually, fear not, fear not as a command, those words have been used a number of 71 times in the Bible in the King James Version, fear not. So statistics speak something. Statisticians in the house? Statisticians ni watu ahesabu ama watu. Statisticians, praise the Lord. By the way, in your high school, you did something called statistics, isn't you? And probability. So it's from there, statistics is from there. It's not something outside of this. Really. That's where I'm borrowing from. That's where I'm borrowing from, from the basics of high school. Praise the Lord. 71 times. So this has some implication of speaking something to us that it is one of the most repeated commands in the Bible. By the way, fear not is a command. You are being told, fear not. Not that if you find it convenient, do not fear. Like if you find it, okay, do not fear. Fear not. Why? Why, by the way? Because um, fear is almost there. Is almost there. Is almost there. Fear always accompanies you wherever you go. But in every opportunity where you, sh you can fear, there's an opportunity to be brave, there's an opportunity to be bold. There's an opportunity to trust and believe in God. You know, I think we fear because we look at ourselves. We look unto ourselves. The focus is unto ourselves. For instance, if I have a project and I look at my bank account and see the balance and realize I cannot meet the financial threshold, I fear because I looked in the bank account. That is the source of fear. Looking at yourself and what you have. I'm not saying you do not... Uh, draw your projections when you're starting something and plan. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, in all the projects you're going to do, depend on God first. Before you can look in your bank account, look at God. Before you can look at your energy, at yourself, look at God. Want to fear? So fear comes in when you look at yourself because uh, the mountains, by the way, you're speaking about, they are bigger. But they, a mountain, a mountain is not a hill. And even if it's a hill, a hill is bigger than us. Like Simulima, a mountain is a mountain. A mountain is bigger than us. You understand? A mountain is not like this. Big. A mountain is huge. A mountain speaks. <laughs> what I'm saying is a mountain of problems. Now let me use that. A mountain of problems is big. A lot of problems. Mountainous. Huge. It is not like something small. No, it is something big. Already it's bigger than you. So when you look at yourself, <laughs> somebody is laughing there, having a laugh. Thank you so much. When you look at yourself, the mountain is already bigger. It's already bigger. So come on, it does not be logic. You're comparing what you have with the mountain. It's already bigger than you. Which mountain do you know? Kenya. Mount Kenya. Okay, which mountain do you know when you have seen it physically? Mount Kenya? Mount Longonot? Eh? You have seen it physically? Thank you. I'm not saying she has not gone to Tanzania. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> because, you see. <laughs> if you have not gone, may the Lord grant you grace to go there this year in Jesus' name. <laughs> she could be prophesying you don't know. Why didn't you say Mount Everest? Anyway. Live along the mountains. There is that hill in your local place, Ushago Kwenyu, in your shags. The hill. You see a hill? A hill is already bigger than you. So I'm just saying, 
Do not compare yourself. Do not look at yourself at the face of your mountains. They are already big. I mean, you cannot do anything about them unless the Lord. I was giving a few characteristics of fear. Uh, number one, fear is not compatible with the faith. The two are not compatible. Compatible means <laughs> they are not compatible anyway. <laughs> number two, <laughs> they are not compatible. The grace is sufficient. You people are landed and I bless the Lord. Making my work easier. <laughs> they are not compatible. Uh, this is the youth service. Uh, one of the questions that is mostly asked in relationships is the compatibility kind of questions. One has fear. Are you compatible? I don't know. How should I know? I don't know. Compatibility. So faith and fear, they are not compatible. You like it or not. It will not. It cannot mix. It cannot agree. It will not form a solution, in other words. Anyway, uh, that is that. Fear confronts your faith. Fear says to you, are you sure you are going to do that this year? Did you hear well? Are you sure you heard well? And, and I'm sure it's not just me who have ever asked myself that question. I say, Niliskia God, I'm a Niliota. Is it true? That is fear. Is it true? And fear, by the way, you don't know where the fear comes. Another characteristic of fear is that it creeps in so easily. It creeps in so easily. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, the sin that so easily entangles. It entangles so easily. You don't know when it creeps in. It just picks you like... You, you think you are using logic, but ni, ni, ni whispers from the enemy. At any logic. Now, even Antaweza. Will I... Really? Am I prepared enough? I want to submit to us. If the Lord has told you to go, go. You know go? Go. Yes. You know what is to go? It is a verb. Do it. And a verb is a doing word. <laughs> Fear again is very destructive. It will destroy everything good in you. It will destroy your peace, your joy, your happiness. It will not spare. It will destroy you. Anxiety. It will destroy you. May the Lord help us. Fear is very weakening. It's very weakening. It's very weakening. If you have ever been to somewhere the first place, let me use a stage fright as an example. I bless the Lord because the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen. So... We do not fear. Uh, stage fright. Sometimes you can fear um, <laughs> until your knees start colliding with one another. <laughs> yes, there's some kind of pain that comes when your knees knock. Eh? Uh, so fear, that's what I'm saying, is that it weakens even your physical form. It weakens you. You cannot do anything. Um, countering fear, I have said uh, that God has not given us, that is 1 Timothy 1 7. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So, fear is nowhere in God. And by the way, let me distinguish. The fear I'm using here, it is what I defined. But there is another fear used in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, that the, uh, f the fear of the Lord is the beginning of. That is not the same as this one. They are, both of them are fear, but this one is what I have defined. The other one, talked about in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord, is reverence, is holy fear, it is respect, it is adoration, praise the Lord. So that is you revere God, you respect God. So fear is not of God. First John 4, 18, and I want you to listen to this, First John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment or punishment. Um, but he who fears has not been made perfect in. He who fears has not been perfected in love. So may the love of God perfect you today. May you be perfected in the love of God today. That you shall not fear. You shall not fear or be afraid of anything. Yeah, I was talking about the help. Let me look at some 
characteristics of help from God again. It is on time. It is always timely. The help from God. It is timely. It is on time. God is never late. God is never? Yes. And here again, I want to come to you at your level. God is never late. Regardless of your, biolog of your biological clock, God is not late. Regardless of the biological clock of Sarai or Sarah and Rebecca, God was not. So it is you who thinks God is late and you better drop that thinking. God is not late. You are just impatient, by the way. Praise the Lord. God is not late. You are You're just impatient. So please, touch, touch your neighbor to them. Be patient. Be patient, man. So long as God has granted you life and health and everything, so long as you're still breathing, God is never late. And by the way, even if, God forbid, even if you think whatever you, was, you were waiting for has died, Lazarus died and stayed in the tomb for how many days? Did he come back to life? Because he's the author of life, he can bring it back. Whatever situation has died in your life, I declare in Jesus' name, may the Lord bring it to life. May the Lord bring it back to life because he is life. I mean, when you have God, you have life. Can these dry bones come back to life? Yes. Ezekiel says, I do not know, but you know. Yes. Prophesy. Yes. Let me continue because I want to respect time. Uh, I said the help from God, it cannot fail, and it is sufficient. It is sufficient. It is sufficient. In Atosha. It is sufficient. If God commits to help you, he will help you indeed. He will help you indeed. So, Achana is a shortcut. As it talks idea. You hear of people, I will not mention names, names with help. Uh, some commodities we buy, kutoka luduli ama tao. And then, whatever you bought, I don't know what you bought. I'm just saying a few commodities. <laughs> After two weeks, you go back again. That is manipulation, it's not help. May the Lord help us. Because that person wants you to keep coming, keep coming. So they are using that as a bait. I want your money. I sell you something, and then I know after a week it's going to not fail, it's going to fail, so that you can come back to me. That is, anyway, ungodly. It is sustainable and long-term, as said. It is permanent once and for all. Once and for all. I want to look at terms and conditions. Terms and conditions. You know, in the kingdom of God, we are in a kingdom, by the way, if you didn't know. Yes. You think only Saudi Arabia in a kingdom? We are in a kingdom also. The kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. The kingdom of God. And there are some rules, there are some terms and conditions, there are some principles in that kingdom. I better tell you the truth. Actually, by the way, even for you to get born again, you comply to a condition. You did what? Yes, what did you do to comply? That's what I'm asking. You believed. You confessed your sin. As Romans 10, 9 to 10 says, that if you believe in your heart, Thank you. You comply to that condition. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you get born again. There are some terms and conditions we must meet for God to help us. And this is just a way of reminder because they have been said here time and time again. Pastor Moshi, when he was speaking, he said so. Uh, that number one, you have to admit that you are weak. Kubali. Admit that you are weak. And that you need help. Denying your weakness, by the way, will not make you stronger. It will just make your weakness persist. It will make your weakness persist. You will just be there with your weakness and justifying your weakness, just justifying, do not judge me. I just sinned in one way. Many people sin differently. You cannot deny your weaknesses and change. Denying your weakness will not help you. You must admit that you are, you, you are weak and that you need help. Um, accepting that you are weak is accepting again the Lord to see your nakedness. Accepting the Lord to see your nakedness. Paswahili walisema, shako msima tusi, mficha uchi afanyi nini? Msio mimi ni njini mesema. 
msichauti azai two things help is available number two are you willing to take that help are you willing to expose your ego to let god crush and smash your ego accept that you have anger issues accept that you have humility issues when all of us know humility is a fruit of the holy spirit to you humility is an issue <laughs> accept that you have issues with submission accept that you have an issue with loving your brother and one another just accept tell your neighbor just accept mwambie na hiyo tone just accept The Bible says in Psalms 127 that unless the Lord builds the house those who build it labor in vain and the Lord unless the Lord watches over our city the watchman stays awake in vain you might have tried time over time and time and time again and failed and you if you try it that way I want to guarantee you you will still fail again why don't you do it differently this time round why don't you allow God just allow God to help you this time round because unless the Lord watches So that does not mean that we should not have night guards again but it means it is the Lord who protects everything that we have. Bonus here, it is the Lord who gives sleep to those who he loves. So in as much as you eat a lot of food. Njo ulala vizuri. It is the Lord who gives sleep. You know why everything that we are in the Bible says that he created the world We are in the season of fasting by the way. So I hope you don't misunderstand me. I'm saying this. Every system in the world, the Lord has control over it. Be it your personal, physical, the doctors say that one of the most complicated system on earth is your body. Is your body. That's why they take six years. Is your body. And mechanics they just take a few a uh, short span of time. I have nothing against the mechanics. I have nothing believe you me I love them. Uh, one day I will own a car and I will require one or two bonus fuel. So I'm just saying even that which you think it is the most complicated the Lord God of hosts <laughs> can be able to do it. Is not limited is not, that nothing is beyond God. Praise the Lord. C.H. Spurgeon says this that the first qualification of serving God with any amount of success is a sense of our own weakness. The first qualification a sense of our own weakness accept that you are weak accept that you are inadequate accept that you need god accept that you need the holy spirit to help us praise the lord um yes the lord is faithful you are help again must come from something and someone higher i said the mountains are already bigger than you so you cannot say i will conquer these mountains you see in the case of zerubbabel it is the lord telling him address them and ask them who are you oh great mountains before zerubbabel it is not because zerubbabel is great it is not because zerubbabel is able the verse there the, that comes before that verse says it is not by might or by strength and i said it will happen but you better agree and admit that it will not happen because of your strength it will happen but not because of your strength you are weak you need to be helped you cannot do it jeremiah 17:5 uh, the bible says that cast is someone who trusts in in man so again i talk do not knock the wrong door do not knock the wrong door knock the right door because if you keep disturbing us we cannot help you by the way I, i'm not saying we should not help one another i'm saying there are some issues that are beyond us we are limited as human beings i said we are weak and prone to fail we cannot handle everything but god can so please know the right door that you knock please knock on the door of prayer knock on god and he will open praise the lord god because it's only god who is bigger than your problems god is bigger than your fears god is bigger than your mountains god is fig- bigger than your anxieties only god me i am not sometimes i even don't know your fears i have not been there so if you tell me you are suffering from this i may not help you i will only comfort you but ultimately you need god to clear it away and to help you praise the lord as i draw to an end god will require you to cooperate and partner with him in the quest to thresh your mountains as he helps you he has his part and you have your your part 
not all mountains will be dredged the same. In some cases, uh, God will tell you, like Moses, strike the rock for water. In other cases, he will tell you, speak to the rock for the same resort for water. So you need to be very attentive which mountain is being dredged which way. Because the approach is different. In some instances, the Lord will tell you, stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. In some other cases, he will tell you, go around Jericho seven times. In some cases, he will come in thunder and enlightening to Elijah. In other cases, he will come in a still, small voice. And that is how we miss God. Because we just we have put God in a box. He can only answer me through this way. He can only come and attend to my cases this way. No. No, that is not our God. If you feel yourself cornering and boxing God, I, I want to correct you. The God that I know, you cannot box him. You cannot corner him. So please, ex expect God. Be very attentive to know wh how the Lord wants you to handle this situation this time round. Even the word of God is double-edged. Amen. You know what that means? Double-edged. It has two, two sides. So it is not just one-sided. That's what I'm meaning. Um, number two, in this case we have read in Isaiah, here the Lord wants to help us to dredge the mountain. He's not dredging these mountains for us, by the way. Can we go that for a moment in Isaiah chapter, so that, uh, Isaiah chapter 41 verses uh, 15, 15, 15. Um, behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge. The Lord is making you into a sledge. Uh, with sharp teeth, you shall dress the You shall, tell your neighbor, you shall dress the mountains. Yes, what the Lord is doing here is making you effective for work. So your part is to dress the mountains. The Lord will help you. How? He will make you sharp with many teeth, effective to bring those mountains down, to become like chaff. So the Lord in this case, as I've said, you listen to him, he's making you sharp. Sharp, you know, sharp, he's making you sharp. Sharp, I pray, in all aspects, even here, in all ways. Bonus, if you were. Yes. Um, number two, is that there's partnership. There's partnership. The case of Lazarus, again, as I alluded to, verse 11, chapter 11, verses 38 to 45, Jesus had people to roll away the stone, and him he called back to life. Who? Lazarus. Uh, between rolling away the stone and calling someone back to life, which is easier? Between rolling a stone away, of course, I do not know, I have never been to those tombs, but I presume it was a big stone that was closing the entrance of the tomb. Between rolling that stone away and calling someone back to life, which is easier or which is difficult? Is di easier or difficult? Wanjala is saying, rolling the stone away <laughs> is more difficult than calling someone back to life. May you receive that grace to resurrect people in Jesus' name. That is what he's saying in other words. Rolling the stone away and calling someone back to life, which is easier? So does that mean Jesus was not able to roll the stone away? Are, we, are you with me? Does it mean now that Jesus told the people to roll the stone away, he was not able? Is that what it means? No, it means there was some kind of partnership here. You roll the stone away, I call him back to life. Uh, what this says uh, is that we need to do our part in any case. Even in threshing the mountains. We need to do our part and go to do his part. And, 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 and if you read that uh, scripture, I pray that you read, mother, the sister of Lazarus, is want to bargain and want to argue. When they're told to roll the stone away, she's like, you know, by this time now, there is a fall and stench. There's a very unpleasant smell coming out. So she's not getting it. But I want to tell you, if the Lord does... If the Lord tells you to do your part, you do your part. How he will do his part is none of your business. Whether it is smelling or not, you do your part. Again, become obedient. Simple instructions. Do your part, the rest leave it to God. If the Lord tells you to plant during the drought like Isaac, plant. Where the rain will come from, it's not yours to know. 
if the Lord tells you from here, go through the wilderness, do what, do what, you just obey. The details are with the Lord. Trust the Lord with the details, and that is faith. That believing God, actually, evidence of what we do not see. You cannot see rain. You cannot, see, you cannot but spiritually, I pray that you may see. That seeing you will perceive, and hearing you will understand. Because the Lord will cause you to hear and to speak, and to speak forth. Praise the Lord. So, just do. Take it away. Obey. How the Lord will do his part, trust him with that. I want to draw to a conclusion and tell us this way. In Psalms 32 verse 8, this is what the Lord says. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. That is the Lord committing again to watch over us, to guide and instruct us. I want to su submit to us, brothers and sisters, this morning that help is available. Help is available in God. God is our help. He can be trusted. He does not fail. He has never failed. He will not start now. He cannot fail. The Bible says that justice and righteousness are the foundation of his throne. He has established his faithfulness in the heavens. He cannot fail. He has committed to help you. Would you allow him to help you? Let us pray. Father, God, in the name of Jesus, we love you and we thank you. Your word has come forth that you have committed to help us and you want to help us. Oh, we desperately need that help, oh God. We ask of you, Jesus, that would you help us to be cautious. You, you help us to be cooperative and willing to obey because you are saying if we are willing and obedient, we submit all our fears to you, God. Drown our fears in your perfect love. I pray that your perfect love will drive out fear in us, that we shall not fear anything, because everything, nothing is beyond you, O God. I pray and I bless everyone listening here, O God, everyone seated here, that their destiny, their futures are bright, that God, according to your help, they are going to shine again. They are going to do it again. They are going to be able to achieve it again. But how I pray, God, would you help us to understand and realize that we are weak and that we need you? We thank you and we bless you. Be with us and go with us all the days of our lives. We love you and we bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. And the church say? Amen. And the church say? Amen. Clap for God. Appreciate the Lord. Thank you so much. I love you. And the Lord bless you again.